Only knows what happened yet. I was all happy when I knew that he did something. Tonight, after being convicted of a crime he didn't commit, a First Nations man has been acquitted and exonerated after 50 years. All the details we received from the callers indicate there was a risk to the public. A man is dead after a police-involved shooting in Winnipeg's North End. Order up! And a new food truck is making the rounds in B.C., serving up all things bison. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. Half a century ago, Clarence Woodhouse was sent to prison for a murder he always said he never committed. Today, Manitoba Court of King's Bench Chief Justice Glenn Joyell ruled Woodhouse is innocent and was wrongfully convicted. Reporter Sierra Bettens has more. It's a moment Clarence Woodhouse has waited over 50 years for. Today, at the Manitoba Court of King's Bench, the 72-year-old was acquitted and exonerated of a murder he was wrongfully convicted of in 1974. Outside the courthouse, the soft-spoken man from the Penemitang First Nation held up a black t-shirt with the words innocent on the front. What are you looking forward to doing now, you know, now that you're, that um, this has happened? Well, the public is just to relax, relax, relax. Yeah. Uh, my son there. Grandchildren? Yeah, my grandchildren too. 50 years ago, Clarence Woodhouse, along with Alan Woodhouse, Russell Woodhouse, and Brian Anderson, were convicted of killing Winnipeg chef Ting Fong Chan. Though So To is his first language, his conviction was based on a confession written in English. Woodhouse testified that members of the Winnipeg Police Service coerced him into making a false confession. The trial judge and all white jury did not believe him at the time. Innocence Canada lawyers representing Woodhouse said it was a clear case of systemic racism. The Crown, uh, Ms. Jules, and we, and indeed uh, the Chief Justice, all acknowledged that there was racism inherent from the investigative stage, the prosecutorial stage, and the judicial stage. In July 2023, Alan Woodhouse and Brian Anderson were also acquitted of the same crime and exonerated. Two months later, Clarence Woodhouse submitted his request to Federal Justice Minister Arif Farani, who ordered a new trial for him in July 2024. And in court today, Chief Justice Glenn Joyle acquitted Woodhouse. You are innocent, he said. You should not have been convicted. What did it mean for you to hear the Chief Justice say you are innocent? I mean, I was happy. I was all happy when I knew that he did something. After court, the Woodhouse family was invited to the Manitoba legislature to receive an apology and gift from the Premier. The gifts from the premier, you know, I just love it. During a House sitting, Manitoba Attorney General Matt Weeb acknowledged how the justice system failed Woodhouse. Well, nothing can be said that will bring back the years lost of freedom or the time away from family and friends. As the Attorney General of Manitoba, I offer my heartfelt apologies to Mr. Woodhouse and his family. The Innocence Canada lawyers representing Woodhouse are now calling for a federal and provincial task force to approach systemic racism in the justice system. Premier Knews said, while he hasn't discussed that matter, the province has been working to address these issues through the Manitoba Aboriginal Justice Inquiry for decades. Sierra Bettens, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Still in Winnipeg, a man is dead after Winnipeg police were called to an apartment building in the north end of the city on Wednesday. Tenants of the building have been quiet, many worrying for their safety as they have no idea who the man was. Here's T.R. Wheatley now with what is known about the latest police-involved death in Winnipeg. We do this as we want to be transparent. Within hours of a man being shot by Winnipeg police officers, well, Acting Chief Art Stenard called a press conference. There was multiple 911 calls on this incident. The male was armed with and swinging edge weapons, banging on tenants' doors. All the details we received from the callers indicated there was a risk to the public. 
This video was captured by Sue Caribou, a tenant of the building. When they bought somebody out, they were working on that person all the way to the ambulance. WPS say he was later pronounced dead at the hospital. The acting police chief said three officers met a male in the hallway. Stenard said a taser and firearm were discharged, but could not confirm if there was only one or multiple firearms used. WPS are limiting details because Manitoba's Independent Investigation Unit, or the IIU, is taking over the matter. The IIU is called anytime someone support. is killed by police. The next Kim has not been notified yet, so I cannot talk about the deceased at all. Caribou said so far no one knows who the man was in the hallway. We are a big family here and we look after each other. Leaving her to think he was a transient. How can we keep this building safe? We have swipe cards, but people behind you, they run in. Caribou said she's gone to check on her neighbors. Many are too scared to open their doors. Outside the building, not much people coming or going. This is the third Winnipeg police officer involved death in the past month. On September 2nd, Tammy Bateman, a First Nations woman, was hit by a police cruiser near a homeless encampment by the Red River. On September 15, a 52-year-old man was arrested for an outstanding warrant. He was held in a cell at police headquarters after being medically cleared. Hours later, during a routine check, the man was found unresponsive. He was taken to hospital where he was pronounced dead. Police have not released his identity, but sources say he is First Nation from northern Manitoba. T.R. Wheatley, APTN National News, Winnipeg. In a prepared statement, the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs said they are deeply concerned by ongoing incidents, particularly when First Nations individuals are involved. AMC said it also it is also particularly alarmed by systemic flaws within oversight bodies that investigate police conduct. A person died Monday while visiting a housing program at the Whitehorse Emergency Shelter. The Yukon government confirmed in an email that the person died from a suspected overdose. The nonprofit group who operates the shelter says the person who died did not live in the shelter. They were visiting a resident on the top floor of the building. The group and the Yukon Coroner Service are not identifying the person. An inquest into the deaths of four First Nations women who died from drug overdoses at the shelter was held earlier this year. It revealed at least 10 people died at the shelter since 2020, most of which were from drug overdoses. Statistics show around 90% of people who use the shelter identify as Indigenous. Time for a quick break. Still to come, our Truth in Politics panel will look at the rise in residential school denialism. Welcome back. September 30th has been the official national day for truth and reconciliation since 2021. It's a sad holiday for some to honor Indigenous children who went to residential schools away from home and family for months at a time. And while the effects are still felt to this day, some Canadians deny it, and it seems that that is on the rise. For more, our Truth and Politics panel is here. Negan St. Clair is a columnist with the Winnipeg Free Press, and Jennifer Lewitz is a partner at Pasqua Harbour Strategies. Jennifer Negan, thanks for being with us. Uh, Negan, let's start with you and, and just how bad is the denialism? How widespread do you think it is? And what do you think is motivating people to say that these atrocities never happened? So there's really like two different types of denialism and they're both intertwined, but uh, one is talking about the, not the fact that residential schools didn't happen. There's not a lot that, uh, make that argument. There's a, a few, but generally what the argument is, is that uh, ex uh, survivors exaggerated their experiences. Uh, generally, residential schools were good. And that overall, uh, thank God, Europeans showed up and set up these Christianized schools because our people would be lost without them. There's that argument. But then there's this more recent argument, which is really dark. And that argument is that 
uh, all of those claims of lost children is, are just made up or uh, evidence of poor record keeping and we just need to generally forget about the idea that there is uh, anomalies that suggest graves at residential school sites on top of the fact that there is 10,000 at least minimum children that went to the schools, never came home, nobody knows what happened to them. And there is well within the realm of possibility that some of them perhaps uh, moved to the city, didn't keep track of, changed their name, could have been. But generally, the fact is that survivors have told us that the children have starved children ran away and were frozen and also that they were murdered at those schools. And the bottom line of it is, is that survivors are to be believed because they were the first hand accounts of what happened. And so we need to look for those children. And these anomalies at residential school sites are a fact and we need to look. Uh, Jennifer, I think all of our Twitter accounts were pretty gross uh, this week, uh, in particularly yours. It seemed like on September 30th, like there was some kind of, you know, pre-planned event here, but stuff with like, where are the bodies emblazoned on shirts? Um, what do you think, uh, or how do you try and make any sense of any of this? I think there is the underlying issue that we need to address that there are people that exist out there that do not like Indigenous people. And I think that it's not a coincidence that the more that we talk about truth and reconciliation, the more of this that comes out of the woodwork. Um, you're right. I posted a photo on Monday of me wearing an orange shirt and I had put in the caption that we are the grandchildren and descendants of the Indians that they tried to eliminate. And at the end of the day, that was that was standard. That was what the government wanted to do. There was you know, words documented that said, we want to remove the Indian from the child. And now those children of children of children are here today, we're existing, and we're not gone, we're here. And I think, you know, even saying that and that photo going somewhat viral upset a lot of people. And, you know, I faced an incredible amount of racism and backlash and people negotiating history and, it's, it's just ugly, and I think a lot of it is rooted in so many different things. You know, the dislike for Indigenous people, not wanting to talk about the history, um, guilt. I think people are carrying some guilt that they feel like somehow they're being blamed for it, um, but they're not sure how to direct those emotions. And unfortunately, they're taking it out all in the wrong ways and making it worse. Negan, this doesn't just exist on Twitter either. There's uh, people with websites, news agencies, so-called news agencies. Uh, books have been released on this. It's, it's basically becoming an industry of some sorts. Uh, people are making their career off just simply denying what residential school survivors have said, what the TRC report has said, what reputable research says, which is that uh, there is a need to look at residential school sites for an immense amount of children that uh, may or may not, in some cases, be buried in these places. Uh, the fact is that if you think that there's bodies kind of be coming out of the earth, um, a, you don't understand science, and B, you're macabre, you're sick. Uh, it, it is, it, that is not what searches are for. What searches are looking for are DNA, oftentimes small pocket searches, looking for human remains in soil, which is like looking for a needle in a hay haystack. It's gonna take decades to search sites to look for children who were likely, if they did die, were inappropriately buried. And that, divert, that deflects from the absolute issue, which is the fact is that 10,000 children went missing in this country. The country paid for churches who then were supposed to care for these children and these children disappeared. That is a stain on all of us, the entire country. And if in the process people show some anger towards the churches or perhaps have some uh, strong words or even actions, I mean, that's part of the journey of reconciliation is, is beginning to listen and look and seeing what justice looks like. And so for those who wish to call me or Jennifer or others haters or that we somehow are promoting hate against churches, that's absolutely nonsense and completely to deflect from the issue. Um, I wish that people would perhaps do a little bit of research, show some human empathy and listen a bit more than perhaps get on the social media. Jennifer, when does something like this become hate speech? Uh, you know, when does free speech cross over into hate speech and what could be done about that? I think that's, I think that's actually a really good question because there are some people that are mad at me right now for saying that, you know, because some of these accounts that were saying what I would define as hate speech, like if you saw some of the screenshots I had posted of some of the things being said to me, 
that is it, it's unacceptable and not only that it's very very concerning it concerns me the type of people that are behind these accounts and now there's free speech advocates coming in saying well you know what i think we should be able to have absolute free speech in this country and my question is do you think that's acceptable do you think it's acceptable for people to say those types of things to people because at the end of the day if these are the people existing in society in whatever role that they're in that's very very concerning if you don't have the mental capacity to scroll past an orange shirt day tweet without going down the rabbit hole and acting out in that way that that really concerns me and i think that this is something that we should be watching closer Jennifer Degon, we'll have to leave it there, but I always appreciate hearing your thoughts on things. Thanks for being with us. Great. Yeah, you much. Thanks. Thanks. Have you noticed the rise in residential school denialism? We'd like to hear from you about that or anything else. Here's how to continue the conversation. If you have a story you'd like to share with us, you can send us an email to news at aptn.ca. You can read and watch our stories by going to our website aptnnews.ca. You can also find us online on your favorite social media sites including TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn and X. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. Our weekly political show returns this week. So does APTN Investigates. We've got previews of both coming up after the break. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Rosie Browning spent this National Day for Truth and Reconciliation with family and friends to honor those who passed away and those still with us today. Thanks for sharing the moment, Rosie. Be sure to send us your pictures from September 30th to share at aptn.ca. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, 20 in Halifax and Charlottetown. Nine with showers in Kujuwak, 12 and rain in Nain. 22 with showers in Montreal, showers in 16 in Valdor. 15 in Sault Ste. Marie, rain and 18 in North Bay. 19 in Thunder Bay, sun's out and 14 in Sioux Lookout. 10 in God's Lake and Norway House, 11 in the Paw. 17 in Winnipeg, 19 in Brandon, 19 in Regina, 18 in Saskatoon, 14 in Meadow Lake and La Ronge. In Northern Alberta, rain and 6 in high level, cloudy and 8 in Fort Chippewan, 16 in Edmonton, 23 in Lethbridge. Showers and 15 for Vancouver, Victoria, and Tofino, 10 with rain in Prince George, rain and 11 in Smithers. Sunny and zero in Old Crow, eight under sunny skies in Whitehorse. Three in Yellowknife, sunny and five in Norman Wells. Two in Saks Harbor, minus one in Pulatuck. Five in Chesterfield, snow and four in Arviette. Zero in Resolute, four in Aglulic. A Métis man in British Columbia has big dreams to take his business to the next level. APTN's Tina House has his story. Order up! Scott Dumas owns Stampede Burger, a food truck that specializes in bison. Everything from burgers to bison poutine. We put some bison farmer sausage on top of, of that and um, that gives my customers an opportunity to try bison at lower price scale and less commitment as like the large having a burger, right? Um. Dumas is Métis and says his culture plays a major role in his business. He collaborated with fellow Métis entrepreneur Melly McInnes, who owns the farm where his food truck is based. I was looking for a place to vend, primarily a base location and um, of course already knowing Mel and having con connections that that were doing business with her and um, the two of us got together and um, I asked her if I could come bend here and she said yes she'd love to have me and I've been here ever since. It's a wonderful place and um, food was a perfect introduction. We have products that are grown here on this farm 
like our salad, which I bend with our keto dish. And so that's super proud for me. Uh, winter time, I'll be introducing bison stew, bison chili. He says business is good, and he has some advice for others that want to start their own business. It takes a lot of perseverance. There's lots of things that you don't know that you're going to have to do, and um, you have to persevere, right? And just keep going and um, follow your dreams, and whatever that looks like, yeah. <laughs> Tina House, APTN National News, Langley. Never had bison poutine, looked pretty good. Time to head over to our Ottawa studio now where Fraser Needham is standing by to tell us what's ahead on the season premiere of Nation to Nation. Coming up after the news, Canada's special interlocutor on missing children and unmarked graves says the Trudeau government continues to tighten the rules when it comes to First Nations applying for funds for these searches. Hill Times columnist Rose LeMay says Canada's police forces cannot afford to wait any longer to reconcile with Indigenous people. And NDP MP Nikki Ashton says the federal government has completely dropped the ball on its commitment to provide safe drinking water to one particular First Nation in northern Manitoba. All this ahead on Nation to Nation. Thanks, Fraser. We'll see you in a few minutes. APTN Investigates also returns this week to kick off an all-new season. The award-winning investigative news show is making the move to a new day, Saturdays, here on APTN. In the great change, investigative journalist Kenneth Jackson travels to the Wasoxing First Nation in Ontario. Drug dealers are moving in and exploiting vulnerable members. And with Robinson here on treaty money, concerns have never been higher. Here's a preview. We arrive in Wasoxing just a few weeks before millions in treaty money is going to be released across the territory and the First Nation is right beside the town of Perry Sound. The town's problems can quickly become the First Nations and vice versa. And while there's a similar signs of a small town struggling with drug addiction, this is a first. The local child protection agency recently moved in right next to the methadone clinic downtown. I covered the child and family services system for five years and never seen anything like this. If this is how bad things are, what's going to happen when some people struggling get $100,000 deposited right into their bank account? Hi. Hi. I'm a reporter from APTN. I'm just in town working on a story. And I, I couldn't help but notice that you guys are next to the methadone clinic. I just thought that was an interesting dynamic. I'm wondering why CAS is right next to a methadone clinic. Um, if you want to hang on, I can get our supervisor. Okay, great. The supervisor never comes to the door, but they give me a card of someone to call. Looks great. Remember, you can catch the season premiere of APTN Investigates, The Great Change, airing this Saturday on APTN. And you can catch Nation to Nation in less than two minutes' time, as we're all out of time for your APTN National News for this Thursday. For more, you can visit our website, though, aptnnews.ca. Creason will be here for your first look at the day's news at 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for being with us. Have a great night.